As part of their enduring commitment to justice, equity, and expression, the Open Society Foundations are proud to sponsor Many Lumens. You're listening to Many Lumens, where we talk about and find meaning in the intersections of art, social change, and popular culture. I'm your host, Maori Carmel Holmes. For this episode, I'm joined by Terrence Nance, an artist, musician, and filmmaker born in Dallas, Texas. Nance wrote, directed, scored, and starred in his first feature film, An Oversimplification of Her Beauty, which premiered at the 2012 Sundance Film Festival and was released theatrically in 2013. Nance was named a Guggenheim Fellow in 2014 and debuted his Peabody award-winning television series, Random Acts of Flyness on HBO in the summer of 2018. At the time of this recording, Nance was preparing to release season two of Random Acts of Flyness and his debut album, Vortex. I'm also joined by filmmaker, artist, and my friend, Rashid Zakat. In this conversation, we talk about Terrence's childhood and what it was like for him growing up in a family of creatives, his personal journey and exploration as an artist, and the process of learning to not only find, but appreciate his own voice. We also touch on love, both platonic and romantic, the importance of community, the film industry, music, and much more. And now for our conversation with Terrence Nance. So let's get into it, shall we? Let's go. Uh, Terrence, can you tell us where you grew up and where you are in the birth order of your siblings? I grew up in Dallas, Texas. And I am second in my siblings. I have older brother, Jure. Jure Nance. And I have a younger sister, Classy Nance. And a younger brother, Nelson Nance, professionally known as Nelson Bandello. And how did your parents come to name you, Terrence? The story I know is that my my parents were tossing around names. Um, my grandfather's name is... EP, we refer to him as EP, my father, my paternal grandfather. And um, EP stood for Easter Patsy. And East, he was named after his grandmother, Easter, um, who was born in bondage in Hayes County in Texas. Um, so, you know, that name Easter be, be being carried through. And so initially, my understanding is they wanted to name me after him, but not use the name Easter because... I didn't say this, but I imagine because he never liked that name. He, I think he thought of it as, the story I understand is he thought of it as a girl's name. And thus EP came up, came along. So they wanted my name to be, so they call me EP. And um, initially it was going to be Emil Patrick, I remember. And then I also heard that at some point when they were considering names, they were going to go with um, Lewis which is my grandmother's name, my maternal grandmother. Her name is Lois Louise. They, we used to call her Grand L, two big L's. And um, so they were going to call me Lewis and name me after her. And I guess I came out and they were like, ah, something else. I don't know. I guess neither of those stuck, that it didn't feel right. And my mother named me Terrence. I think she said that Terrence means... Terrence means smooth or quiet. And she said, I was like smooth and quiet. And um, there's a playwright, Terrence Africanus, who wrote this play called The Brothers. He's a comedy called The Brothers. And, um, you know, um, I I don't know if I was like named after him, but Terrence Africanus was like, uh, you know, in Greece at the time, I believe, you know, writing these these comedies. but I think the, the explanation I got was more so that I was quiet and smooth, and that's, that's why I got that name. And um, Daryl is my father's middle name. So, you know, they put that with me, put, put that with Terrence. And I found, actually, when I was, I, I'd say at some time, I was just cleaning up the upstairs of my house, kind of in my early 20s. I found one of my mother's journals that she only like written one page in and it was the page where she was like going back and forth on my name to which she was going to name me like just seeing how it looked on a page 
it was strange, you know, just thinking about like what life would have been if we had landed on Lewis or Lou. <laughs> <laughs> Lou Nance. Yeah, Lou Nance is a different <laughs> type of energetic. <laughs> Who is Lou Nance? Like Groovy okay. Lou, Big Lou, Groovy, Big Lou. I don't, I don't know how that would have gone. You know, <laughs> big, big, you would have been Big Lou with the camera. You know, big well, Lou he was a football the... player too. So, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I was. You know, play football. Right. What was your childhood like, or what were you like as a child? Rather, you said a little bit. You said you came out. Um, would you say you came out smooth and quiet? Yeah, that's what that's what I was told. Um, if I remember correctly, I mean, I think that sometimes I get confused about the stories about me or my siblings because I think my parents sometimes mix them up. I think it, I don't know if in my story, if, if it's both me and my younger brother Nelson, if we both weren't named at the hospital, if it was like a thing that happened later. I believe they said that about me as well. I think it was definitely happening to Nelson as well. Jure, I know they had the name. My, my dad was like, this is going to be the name. And that was the name. Um, in class, he's named after our grandmother. But yeah, I think as a kid, I was quiet. You know, I was, my family is very boisterous, you know, very um, large and funny, you know, just a typical black Southern family, but like with a heavy lean towards theatricality and musicality, obviously. <laughs> and um, I just remember feeling like shy, you know, and at some point it got very extreme, you know, when I got into a kind of, not kind of a, a very white supremacist school environment, I went very mute, like didn't say a word for several years. And then after a while, it was kind of like, oh, this might be my shtick. I could be just like the quiet nigga. Like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think that that there was some element of it that was related to just a middle child thing, you know, like, the time, you know, growing up, Dre was locally famous. Like he was, you know, I, I would even say regionally famous. He was and is, you know, a prodigy um, as an artist and as a singer. And he was also like, he had that oldest dynamic where it was his proximity to adults just made his social skills like another level. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like, I was kind of like, I do, you know, cause I was second. So I just had that dynamic of like following him around for a while um but he was and it is just impossible to keep up with you know i, I very much knew it wasn't going to be like i'm gonna compete it, you know like some brothers have that dynamic or like you're gonna compete but like he's uncompetable with on all levels especially just as, as a person with charisma so i think i just was like i bowed out <laughs> like, what? i'm like oh, i would be like just something else you know what i mean there was something that uh, the producing team found in an article where you talked about dragging, finding a black and white TV, dragging it into a closet and watching I Love Lucy by yourself in this closet, which feels very uh, almost prophetic <laughs> about I don't know what, but it does. It feels like a scene from something. And uh, do you remember that? Do you recall? Oh, yeah, I did that. I mean, it was partially well, one of me and my me and my two brothers we, for, I say until I was like 12 or so, we all shared one room. Ooh, there, you know, I don't know. Me and Dre just had got into a practice of sleeping in the closet. Mm. It was just like one of those, like, you know, when you're like kind of, you create these little swaddling situations for yourself when you're 10. Like you like to be in confined spaces. I don't know if everybody does that, but we did. Yeah. So like. I like the back of a car hmm. in the same yeah. way. Yeah, so we would do that. We just did that for years and, like, put all our blankets in the closet and go to sleep in there. We moved to a bigger house. We it, we all had our own room. And so I just continued that practice in my own closet. And then, obviously, you know, bedtime, no TV, TV's off, you know. And I was a, I wandered around the neighborhood type a kid. Found a little TV in the tr somebody's trash, picked it up. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know why. <laughs> I definitely didn't expect the TV to work, but it was like it was like what you know, just an old tube TV. It actually had a handle. It was like a small portable TV, mm -hmm. and I would be the type to like pick up things to see if they work out of the trash. That was just my general vibe. And so I did that. I plugged it in. It worked. Edo was back. I remember we, like Star Trek was like the last thing you could watch. The Next Generation, and it was like bedtime after Star Trek. 
after Picard said whatever he said, it was bedtime. So I'd go in there <laughs> and then turn the TV on and that would be all that was on, fall asleep to that. And in my mind, I thought I was like slick and like my parents didn't know, but they must have woken me up in the morning in the closet and seen the TV. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't get away with nothing, but you know, thought did, I would. Did your parents know you were going to be an artist? Is that something that they just assumed? Uh, the, the way they say that they thought I was going to be the one who wasn't. Hmm. You know? but I think, you know, they had Dre and Dre came out the womb, like singing, like Whitney and Aretha, like literally like trying, like playing dream girls over and over again, trying to sing like Jennifer holiday at one years old. You know what I mean? Wow. Like, so it was like, they like, they knew what they got into with him. And for me, my mom says I was like, you know, like a tinker and thought, you know, I expressed I would tell her I want to be an architect or an engineer, things like that. They were more technical. So they thought that's where I was going to go. When did you know that you wanted to pursue becoming an artist? It was, there definitely wasn't a moment, you know, like it wasn't a, um, there still has not been a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I just, I could always draw really well, you know, like I, I noticed that you know, like in art class, people notice that, you know, generally, um, you know, like every, every kid has the thing they don't really have to work at. And they're like, kind of like a little gift thing. And that was, that was definitely part of it, you know, just had the least resistance in that way. So like, by the time I was in college, I was like, oh, I'm an art major because this is my gift, you know, but I was also like, didn't know, you know, just like everybody else, like, I didn't have a plan, you know what I mean? Um, or I had a new plan every day, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> was what it really was. Uh, but, you know, I think I just kept getting validated and encouraged by people and just saw that look in their eyes. Now that I know what it is, it's like, oh, they're looking at me like, you got it. You know what I mean? Like, they're not looking at me like, you ain't got it. You know what I mean? Which, it's only something hindsight, like, you don't know what that is growing up. But now, you know, it's like, oh, they're looking at them like they ain't got it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a tragedy, you know what I mean? But nobody ever, in the art context, nobody ever looked at me like that, you know, for reasons that made sense, you know? And it was quite the opposite. Um, and, you know, for most of my, as a young person, I just wanted to be an athlete. So I was just like, that was all that was on my conscious mind. And, and I don't know, like in my mind, my relative memory of my concept of my childhood and young adulthood was sort of just, I didn't press, I didn't have any feeling of I'm trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? Like I didn't even, I didn't think I had any kind of like existential identity based thoughts. Like am I a blank until kind of lately? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was just, you know, it was very day to day, you know? Um, and it was just like surviving day to day was when I asked myself if I'm an artist or not, you know? Yeah. I'm thinking a little bit only because uh, we just passed Mother's Day. I just spent a day with my mom. Mary's mom is in town. And, and Terrence, I'm just a little bit curious a bit about your mom, the little bit I know, and thinking about like Lincoln, Mary's mom, the little bit I know about your mom and my mom as these like pan Afrocentric black mamas who are trying to raise free or free adjacent black kids who gave a space um, in different ways. And I'm a little bit curious about even the process of that. Do you feel like you chose, and like in a cosmic sense, do you feel like you chose your mom and chose your family? Free adjacent black kids is a great band name. <laughs> I think it's our band. That's our that's our filmmaking. Um, uh, uh, you, me, and Little Love, like family band. Yeah, free adjacent, free adjacent, sure. free adjacent. Um, did I cosmically choose my mother? I mean, I must have. You know, <laughs> like I don't know. My mother, my mother's obviously legendary, a legend in many ways. Um, and her mother is as well, my grandmother, um, in, in, on the, in those terms, like as a person who, you know, articulated herself in a liberatory fashion, in a, you know, reweaving herself with her Africanness and her family's Africanness fashion 
and she was doing that in the, you know, in the, you know, in continuation with her parents, you know, my grandparents. And, you know, as a, she was, you know, she's an artist. So like, you know, you're growing up with a, an actress and an acting coach and an educator and a, a director, quite literally. So I'm just doing what she was doing. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just doing what I watched her do. And, you know, same with my father, you know, he's a, grew up shooting news every day, all day. So like I saw him pick the camera up, put the battery on it, make sure you had the lens right every day for a quarter century, you know? So I'm just doing what he did. And that's, that's never been not clear to me. And the reason it's never been not clear, I think it's just because of just working in a, a ontological family framework. That's like, you have ancestors that they're why you're here doing this. You know what I mean? In a casual way, you know, they weren't like being over the head. They weren't beating us over the head with nothing, you know? And also there, they were in a community of people who were all thinking like that. Like they weren't, we were in no way isolated in that. Like it was thousands of us. Yeah, I think somehow like the three of us, if we were the same age, we would have all been in community because right. there's some nexus between, well, but for the two of you, there's church, but definitely for Terrence and I, there's theater. Same though. That that your mother was into. My mom, no, I mean, my mom got in the theater way later, so. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just like all of those things. I think the like, your mom definitely would have been making the outfits. Right. <laughs> you know? And, like, <laughs> Playing the music in the back, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that, and, and for me too, and I don't know about you, Rashid, but my mother is also second generation um, artist and Afrocentric too. Mm. So I, it is not a reinvention, right? It's a ontological continuation. Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that true? Were your grandparents also conscious? No. No, my mom my mom my mom was the anomaly okay. of the folks. Like she was the first and really the only person on that side of the family to even be on the side of like black consciousness, to think about being it to you know, to think about being an artist. Mm. And um yeah, I I wonder if they she would have come from um you know, if, like if my grandparents would have had you know, my grandparents were very much like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus into the church and that thing I think set my mom's art things up in a way, if that makes any sense. Um, but not anything outside of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like one of those things that it was the wave to it at that time, you know what I mean? Like there was a vibration coming through that first centricity in the 80s and 90s that um, was cool. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I think my, my dad, my dad's side of the family, my dad is really caring for the music, you know, like bringing uh, uh, just a deep love, fascination. You know, like the way that he would use and deploy music in his own life was like water. Mm. Mm. That in in conversation with my mother, like being raised in a context where my mother um, was always rigorously in a process with somebody and oftentimes a lot of kids or students in a theater context that just doesn't, that doesn't look like anything else um, we have now, like in per even acting coaching or, you know, just as a discipline, you know, like how much practice it takes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Watch, watch people in that practice of like, you know, getting a performance, um, it's, it's one of those that you can't skip and you can't not see. You know what I mean? It's like if somebody designs a poster, you could, if your parents were like graphic designers or something like that, you could maybe could miss it, you know? But you can't see. You can't miss if they got to like get all all their lines for piano lesson. <laughs> you know, be ready. Or like, you know, they had to rehearse. You know, my mother directed a lot of plays, you know, so they have to get a company of actors ready. You know, it's, it's very evident, embodied, creative work and expression you know and it was i think at that time very it, it just I, I don't want to say in vogue but it was like it felt like it wasn't othering in any kind of way hmm. you know i think that in the late mid to late 2000s i think on some level you know a concept of like really aspirational capitalism came into all kinds of black culture in a way that maybe made it seem uncool for a moment but that was after they had already raised us a bit. You know what I mean? We were already essentially teenagers by that time. Mm. You were just talking a bit about, you know, you can't unsee, you know, your mom in rehearsal. You can't unsee, um, you know, the things that are sort of 
sort of this pre-digital art performance thing. Um, and just thinking about the sort of the community of that and also connecting that to, I'm an only child. And so I'm always fascinated with people that come from big families um, because in your case, it seems like you're trying to recreate this. And, you know, I'm thinking about MDMT, thinking about Uma Chroma, and even, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about Lala Bella. Um, yeah, it's all yell about it. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know why I keep that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious, like, are you are you sort of thinking about sort of is that something that you're thinking about recreating either the family dynamic or sort of what you grew up with and sort of community and, and, and theater in those places and building your um, building the collectives that you are that you're a part of and have been a part of as an adult? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that I'm working in in, um, in continuation of my parents and grandparents work in that way, you know, but not in any other way that. I would say not to say this is not, it's not romantic. I wouldn't say, I think it's like they were doing so collectivizing, working in, in swarm, in ensemble, in community as a matter of necessity, because they would have made it if they didn't, you know what I mean? And we're in the same situation. Like we, none of those things would be happening if it was just one of us, you know, it would just not work, you know, it would be destroyed. Um, so I think that just like it's un, that's un, that's unromantic continuation of like the unromantic side of the continuation of our my parents and you know my great grandparents institution building I would say maybe most specifically my, my mother and father and uncles I remember they had like how was it called. They had this organization that I didn't even really know the name of until I found a flyer for it a few Christmases ago. And it was like the local art, black art organization in Dallas. I have to ask her what the name of it was, but I remember the feeling of being around it because the flyer was for when they screened killer sheep town. And I remember go I didn't remember going to that because I was too young, I'm sure to go but i remember when they brought um daughters of the dust that uh, it must have been the same organization because i remember that screening you know I, I remember the images in it and seeing it in that moment and so I, I think about that like you know just the practice of facilitating the, the exhibition of black cinema you know like that they had to essentially make up dallas version of black star and my mother was the person and her friends were the people and they took the pictures that day and they brought their kids and like, and they talked to Julie that day and I was there, you know, and like I was two or whatever. I was like little, but, but like that, that's, that's like the thing that they were within that we're still within and we're like, unfortunately the problem hasn't changed or the, the circumstance hasn't really changed. The thing your question brought me to is, more the the survival side of it, but there's also a maybe a more important side of it, which is like whatever that vibe is of collectivizing, making things together, Washington together, making the institutions together. However, whatever that creates in terms of a ritual is really necessary. Like especially like the clan, so seemingly clandestine aspects of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is why I guess you were kind of like, can I mention this? You know. <laughs> There's some truth to that energy of like, can I mention this? Should I? You know, it's like we over here doing this. We can't tell you everything about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to switch gears a, just a little bit, not too much, but um, being from Dallas, I'm curious. You know what you think about your identity as a as a Southern person or a person reared in the South. How much of that uh, comes into play in your work, given that you've spent your adulthood in the Northeast? It comes into play a lot, you know, like, I mean, it's who I am, you know, I, I, I notice it growing up in Dallas. I, 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 I imagine this is typical. A lot of places in the South It's like, you just, you grow up outside, you know what I mean? Like around trees and stuff, you know what I mean? Like in a semi urban environment or dynamic and because of like Dallas is no longer like that, you know, it doesn't have just sort of random open spaces the parks don't feel like that anymore um but i think it's just um 
I don't know. I don't. I don't know that some parts of the sociality of like what is what I grew up with as like a black Southern sort of typical large church going, you know, black IP making family. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying like that it's like typical to this. You know, like I think it's the same in Philly. You know, <laughs> like I don't think it's like I don't know that it, that aspect of it is actually. And maybe I just don't have like a um, granular enough analysis, but I haven't, I haven't felt that, you know, difference um, in the people, in the, in the way that I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm with people, you know, but definitely the way I'm with the environment, the, the land and that whole energy is very different. Before we, um, before we did this, I was reflecting a little bit on when I found your work in maybe like 2009 on Vimeo really randomly. And and it's, it's been one, just really encouraging and really exciting to just have watched your work grow, but also watch you find have found your voice over time. And I'm thinking back to something that you said at, it was the, when you premiered Random Acts of Flyness at Black Star and you were talking about falling in love, you had to learn how to fall in love with your voice. You had to learn how to fall in love with the sound of your voice. And I'm just curious to what that, you know, I guess in any way you wanna approach that, what what is that, what has that been like? I mean, I'm just thinking even the last 10, 12 years of the work that you've created and the experiments that you've done, um, I'm just curious to what that has been like of just finding that or looking for it perhaps. Yeah, I mean, when I was saying that, it was like kind of a bittersweet, moment I don't, I don't remember why my dad was not there there was his health at that time he's he's great now he's he's healthy he seems very healthy now but he couldn't travel to the premiere if i remember correctly and he he had said that to me about singing you know because at that time i had st- you know i was still working on vortex and you know i've been it's, you know a decade of trying to get it done it still wasn't done and I, I don't think he had said that to me in relationship to the album itself but he said that to me about singing and i was always really insecure about my voice my singing voice and so i was quoting him in that moment talking about that journey with my own singing but to your point it was like and that's been a journey but you know to your point in terms of cinema and like finding it there it's been a similar sort of long, long form process of like, because at the end of the day, it's, there's no me, it's just, I'm a vessel. And I think of it somatically, especially with the cinema thing, it's like, I'm trying to make myself available. And the thing that makes it feel like, quote unquote, a Terrence thing is like a remnant of the sort of janitorial process ending to the vessel, which is what gives it a like, oh, this feels like things that, because that that janitor named Terrence was there. It's like we, if you were to walk into a school when one janitor has been there for 25 years, it's like the the doorknobs are polished a certain way and they use a certain cleaner so it smells a certain way, but it's like they didn't build the school. But it, then if the janitor switches to somebody else, it might be just as good, but it's like the school feels different, but you can't put your finger on it, you know? I think it's the same thing. I can see sometimes like how my tending practices just get you know produce a certain vibe you know um and i think falling in love with the vibe is maybe how i used to understand it but it was more like there's something else past falling in love which is like has to be beyond um drawing pleasure from it from experiencing it for me at least it is something more about just like accepting your role <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> accepting my role you know what i mean like you know i've recently you know through a lot of experiences realized my role is to freak motherfuckers out you know what i mean like my role <laughs> is to, like, <laughs> my role is to like you know really diverge from the um what's acceptable you know like and you know, obviously the whole Babylonian constitution is like, wow, man, you really freak people out. But maybe if you didn't, it would be dope. You know what I mean? Like, it's really easy to fall into that. For that to feel like the truth. You know what I mean? Like, oh, um, oh, that's one moment of your 
path. You know, you freak people out for a while, then you grow up. You brought up love, um, and I'm curious um, how you're able to work out, or or actually, if you feel like you're able to work out and explore questions about love and gender and vulnerability through your art making. I think I do. You know, when you, I guess when you're asking, am I able to? Do I feel like it moves the needle or anything? Like it, <laughs> yeah, I mean, are you feeling <laughs> like it's useful and instructive? That's a great question. Is it useful? I don't know. For me, is it useful? Uh, yeah, it's useful for sure. It's useful. It's healing. You know, um, Amani, who's my friend <laughs> and, and assistant, and life support. <laughs> She has this wonderful theory, which I'll repeat for her to say, around romantic love. And it's um, just this function. And I think that, like, thinking about that reminded me of, like, how there's a little bit of a facade or a mask, like, romantic love as a plot device or as a central um, storytelling dynamic is, like, a mask. It's, it's a masquerade for... Uh, a more inarticulable exploration of like different energies, you know, cause that those dynamics in other relationships, other types of, you know, friendships, parent child relationships, you know, are relatively, they don't have this concept of hope built in, you know, like, when you get born into somebody, it already happened. It happened. You date, you date child. It's, it is. It is. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't. It doesn't have like anywhere to go. You know, if you're friends, you're friends. It's gonna be. You're gonna be friends. It's gonna be great. But romantic love as a is a tool, especially as a narrative tool, it just has an inherent like. Are they gonna be together? That's interesting that you say that though. And I, I don't. I don't know if you feel this way, Rashid, but. I, I actually had a lot of romance about my absent father when I was mm. growing up. Mm. I had a lot of hope that he was going to show up and be there. And I think that that may, <laughs> this is my therapy hour. Maybe this is, I mean, my romance is about my astrology, but mm. definitely in relationships, I think with friends and with my father, my mother, um, I think I have had a lot of hope and expectation mm. that is probably unrealistic. Mm. So I wonder if that's true, you know, and I wonder if that has to do with you having so many siblings, right? So it was like not an option for you, whereas my siblings were options. Mm, Both same, of my siblings same, are half same. siblings. You know, I could see them. I could not like it, things are were kind of optional. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I, would, I would say I think you're right when you're talking about real life. Yeah. You're talking about a screenplay, though? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I forgot what we were talking about. Um, well, so I guess on another sort of side of that, you've collaborated with so many of your former partners when you were in partnership with them. And mm. I'm curious how that works out for you. I'm just wondering. I know that Rashid and I, when we're often sort of talking about uh, relationships, like my idea of an ideal relationship is like, holding hands, you know, drinking from the same bottle and like Rashid wants to <laughs> jump out a window, you know, and see you on Tuesdays at five. So sort of <laughs> four thirty if you're good. <laughs> you know, what for you is that a necessity that you collaborate with partners or has it just kind of happened that you've dated filmmakers or where is that in the sauce or do you not know? Uh no, I, I definitely think I think that collaborating with people who I've been in partnership with has been a part of just my development as an artist because I think that like there's some part of my process that is just about like transmuting things that come up in romantic relationships into some sort of like story you know that is that, you know in the making of it no longer becomes a representation of the relationship but it becomes in some like a prism you know, which things can be understood or even just the process of making it becomes like some transmutation of energy, but you know, like that, that, that has gone wrong too. Like it's not, again, like it's not romantic dynamic. You know, like I've gotten it wrong as much as I've gotten it right or, you know, been in that dynamic. But, but I think it's like kind of, at least for me, absolutely necessary that there is a, an engagement, you know, 
It doesn't have to take the form of like, we're going to make something together. We're going to direct something together. Even though that I've done that and that has happened, we're going to write something together. Um, and in relationships with people who have not been filmmakers, there's still collaboration. You know what I mean? There's still, that still happens. It just doesn't get evidenced in a, you know, just, you know see it in a movie theater near you or something, you know? So it's like, but it definitely still happens, you know? Black Star Project celebrates and uplifts Black, Brown, and Indigenous artists. We produce the annual Black Star Film Festival, Many Lumens, Scene, and other projects creating the spaces and resources artists need to thrive. Learn more and support our work at blackstarfest.org. You're listening to Many Lumens, and now back to our conversation with Terrence Nance. I'm, I'm switching gears a little bit and just thinking about music, um, mm-hmm. both you as a musician and, and the musicality of your film work. Um, thinking about the music videos you've worked over the years for Nick Hakeem, Nelson Bandela, Earl Sweatshirt, Solange, so on and so forth, as well as the music you did for Oversimplification. But I'm curious to when you really felt empowered to like share the music that you're making, to share the music that was just in you and, and, and share the music that you were making. Well, I think that... Um... You know, growing up, growing up in a family of musicians, at the time I felt really underdeveloped as a musician because everybody around me was so gifted and worked so hard at it. Um, I, I just cast it off as a possibility for myself because of just an inferiority complex that I imagined <laughs> in that moment, you know. But it was it was also like I was choosing something else, you know. I was choosing another mode of expression. Um but I just slowly realized that, you know, I'm a vessel for it. You know what I mean? Like, as I started writing things, you know, my 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 Uncle Brent, when I graduated high school, he gave me a guitar. I can't remember if I asked him for it. But he gave me a guitar and he taught me one chord. He didn't teach me anything after that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, slowly I just taught myself how to play. And, you know, like, it just started taking the form of writing songs. And, you know, that's just God, you know. Like, at the end of the day, everything that's coming through me is just you know, coming from on high and, and coming through me and it's not mine anyway. But, you know, all this stuff, like, I don't know why this stuff says, especially in the music, I don't know why it sounds like it sounds really, you know, the stories that are there didn't happen to me, <laughs> you know, some, sometimes like, or did in different ways, you know, and it just becomes, you know, yet another exercise in getting out of the way of what was coming through the channel. Um, and I think what comes through my channel is often highly verbose you know, highly just literary in this way that I don't understand totally. And, and, you know, I also, I find myself like, I think that the music as a process just has a somatic signature. It just feels good. It feels a certain way that you can only get in that portal. You know, it ha- it's, a, you know, the sound waves vibrate certain things and certain healings come through just when certain rhythms happen and certain, you know, changes of tone happen. And there's these things only transpire here. You know what I mean? That I know of, you know, in that, in that particular portal of playing, experiencing, feeling, you know, through a, a rhythm and a melody or, you know, that is those, those things don't happen on a movie set, you know, or when you're making a painting or, you know, other things happen there, but you know, not those. How do lyric and song or lyric and music find each other for you? I guess you said your process is uh, a bit more literary. Do you find that you kind of have the stories, you have the words, you have lyrics, and you're looking for the vibe to suit them, or you have sort of like snippets of of sound that you're applying stories to, or how are you thinking through that stuff? Um, It's all kinds of ways. Um, You know, the standard ways, like I'll be walking down the street and something comes in my head and I record a voice now. It's the standard way songs happen for, you know, musicians. But like, you know, so it's, a lot of times you know, I'll just be playing with some chords on that, on whatever instrument, you know, and find something I like and then some, you know, pick up a mic and see what comes through, see what happens, you know. And to describe it as a material practice or process, I think is relatively standard and uneventful because like to describe the actual thing that's happening physically is not to describe the thing. Um, but I think that the, the words like the, oh, this is a lot of words comes a little bit from the fact that especially Vortex was mostly 
not mostly, but some 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 amount of the earlier songs were just poems at first that I'd written in college, and then I saw I went to go see Saul Williams perform his poetry, and it was like he was reading from I think said the shotgun to the head, and um. I just remember having that feeling that like, oh, th- this poem is not the words on the page. It's the sound coming out of his mouth and how carrying the sound. And that just instantly, it redefined the concept of what poetry is to me. It's like, it's not a written, even if it is a written form and you're silently reading it, you're, it's still being performed in your head based on whatever your reference points are. So I was like, all poems are songs. <laughs> Basically, like, that was just like my takeaway. So I was just like, I've been writing basically like a poem a day every morning. And I was like, I'm going to turn all these into songs. So like early on, it was like that. And then I, I just think that like whatever is coming through me, it just has a lot of likes words. Like, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not like something I endeavor to understand in that way. Um, what I do is probably you know, on the human realm, just, sort of a re rehashing regurgitation of all the things my parents put in me, you know, like August Wilson is extremely verbose. Um, Tony Morrison's extremely, you know, like, I don't know if verbose is even aware of it, just like elegaic. There's a lot of, they, they don't spare words, you know, compared to, you know, other literary references we love. They're more, minimal you know octavia butler's more minimal for instance um and i think that the, I, I was exposed to the more minimal sort of artists later probably just because that's what my parents liked <laughs> you know what I mean? like that's what they would bring around or that's just what was happening you know uh, so i think some of that comes through so you just mentioned vortex which is and an album that you've been working on for a decade, but in between, um, I guess it's about 2018, you released an EP called Things I Never Had, but Vortex will be coming out on Brain Feeder. Is that true? Mm. Yeah. Um, it, it, what's interesting to me, I've, I've listened to it a couple of times because of the exhibition that we're working on together. And the first thing that I thought of when I heard it is Fiona Apple. Mm. Like it has this kind of cheekiness, but also vulnerability. And I was curious, do you have any interest in musicals? Yes, absolutely. Musicals are coming. I mean, it's definitely a soundtrack. Like, you know, Nina Simone said, this is a soundtrack. This is a song for a musical that hasn't been written yet. You know? <laughs> yeah. So just to pivot a little bit, we talked about your work in film and we've talked about your work as a musician. And now you're moving A little bit. Um, I know I've curated your work in a couple of group shows that were in gallery spaces and you've done performance work with Sundance and New Media. But, you know, you are in the Whitney Biennial, this year's Whitney Biennial. Congratulations. You have work planned or was at Art Basel. And, you know, we have an exhibition coming up um, next year, your first solo show. And I'm, I'm wondering, how is it feeling to you know, be taken seriously in the sort of capital A art world. When we interviewed AJ last year, he talked about that he didn't choose the art world. It kind of chose him (laughs) after decades of trying to make it in film. And so I'm just curious for you, since you studied art to begin with, is this reception anticipated? Is it shocking? How are you feeling about this transition? Or or not even transition, I'd say addition. No, I, I, you know, I went to studio art. MFA program. I thought that's what I was doing with my life. You know what I mean? Like we about to be in the art world. Like that's what I thought was going on at 20 years old or whatever. And so like where things have gone is relatively, I don't know, whatever, whatever the plan was, not a part, not what I thought, you know, oversimplification for instance, was like, it was made as a loop. Like the last, you got to tell the last scene is the first scene. So I was like, Oh, you know, I'm making these films are going to be in museums but not even really. I was, at that time, I was like, put this shit on the internet. Like, I was really anti-institution and four walls. And like, I thought of it as oligarchical and aristocratic and a continuation of the genocidal dynamics, the Eurocentric aristocracy, you know, all that kind of 20-year-old self-righteous shit. So it's true, you know what I mean? But um, I was like 
on that. So I wouldn't say that like this present moment of the work we're making feels like trans like a transition. I wouldn't say because I guess it's always been happening at a certain register, you know. And it was actually the first thing that was happening before any of the others that was happening. Um, but it does feel like I'm relatively out of practice with like working at a certain scale in those spaces, which is I think a you know just something that I'm like excited to continue to learn, you know and um. I think that there's a so there's there's a tenderness that I'm going into this like learning process with you know that's like based on all the on you know AJ's horror stories about the art world or AJ's experience the beautiful experience in the art world or you know Jatavi's experience in the art world beautiful experience in the art world or her relative you know pain in the art world like I, I hear all the stories of all the people around you know in our community who are interacting with the art world and I'm like you know, in that soup of people and understanding and stories, walking into it, you know, just trying to learn, you know. I'm just thinking through all the things you're working on, music, films, art projects, and you've been working with Telfar Clemens, uh, specifically on Telfar TV. And can you talk a little bit about how you met Telfar, his team, and just what that collaboration is is like? I met Telfar, like, I think Diamond put us in touch, Diamond Stingley. And, you know, met Telfar, met Babak at their show in Florence. And they invited me out to it. And, you know, their intervention in, in that world, in, in the fashion world, you know, I, I just really deeply resonated with, you know, just the imperative to, like, exit, you know, the whole industry, like this mode of production, you know, and all of its genocidal colonial dynamics, and to do so in a way that was just like, not about, you know, just aspiring to some sort of like super cute capitalist dynamic, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I felt like that saying, you know, I, I feel like that's the project for me in general has always been, has always been amorphous in terms of like, what am I really doing? What kind of project is my work a part of in, in community or what is it trying to pattern in terms of my own survival or my own growth and so i think telfar tv and the, the, our partnership with ubukoma and telfar is um just that that hilarious messy <laughs> co-conspiracy of getting out of the whole situation you know and documenting it like showing it happen you know and showing that it like has fits and starts and showing that it's funny and so that it's sad and so that it's bizarre and showing that it's boring and showing that it's exciting and showing that it's definitely not boring and showing that it's you know including everybody who is within this vibration you know is work it's just it's just really beautiful and you know to, to just watch him receive what he's receiving and, and give it to the world you know, it's God's work, you know, at the end of the day. And I think that that's, that's what's calling us all together. You know, I, I, f I felt like a while, like I hadn't met a new person in a while. I think because we met like right before pandemic, but, you know, I remember when I met, I remember when I met both of you, you know, actually, but when I met Maori, it was at Black Star, I believe. And I, I, I remember just being, you know, around you, around the festival, and feeling the 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 word I would use for it now is like the devotional energy of it. You know, like your devotion, seeing you all do what you do, just it's a standard bearing thing in terms of devotion to to your gift and pushing it through. That like just you know makes me step my my thing up. You know, makes me really do it you know at the end of the day i think this it's, it's a it's a continuation of that you know um peopling that that community building you know making telfar tv with with everybody you know Whew. i wanted to be like the ugly cry meme from american top model <laughs> too late right now um i want to ask you um just uh, thinking about um the industry and um, I'm just sort of wondering if, you know, you can share what you have learned 
when things sort of haven't worked out as you expected. You've had some, you know, high profile opportunities, Space Jam directing being one of them. And some people would have seen that as a departure from your work, um, but you didn't. And I would love for you to talk about why it wasn't and also what you learned from that not working out. Yeah, I mean, I guess for context, I had had an idea to make Space Jam for a very long time. I, I think probably my first desire to make a sequel to it was sometime around 2013 or 14. Why? And yeah, it, I don't know what it was or what came up, but it was a dream. I had a dream, actually. It may have coincided with seeing that LeBron commercial where he pays, plays a bunch of LeBrons. Which I think it was actually probably before twenty four. I don't know, but sometimes that was around then too, because this is before LeBron was the person who would be in it. You know, you know, this is before. This is either like right as I had made oversimplification or before that. You know, so I was like kind of not even understanding myself as a filmmaker when I first had the idea to make it. But I had this idea for it. It was based in a dream where I just like had seen LeBron in a tunnel, like before a game. And he was like preparing for the game and it was like kind of lit overhead and it was like all black around him and this whole today they're all wearing like silver uniforms. It was like really soft light and black tunnel and then just cut to black and said Space Jam 2, like in very like austere cinema letters or whatever. And I was just like wondering why that had come up. And so then I just started, you know, like thinking of a story which was, um, you know, about at that time, this idea of a, a person, you know, competing against their own expectations for themselves was in that situation was really about me because I had expected myself to be an athlete, you know. Um, and I was at that time in my life, I think, consistently competing against what I had conceived my life to be as a child and what it was. And like, just in that dynamic, you know, I guess I just say to say, I just had this idea for a movie. It was, it was almost a joke. Cause I was like, at that time, I was a fundamentalist about like, I ain't never working with none of these companies who do none of this, bit, like all that shit is corny. Like, but I will make Space Jam 2. It was a joke basically, you know what I mean? But I was, <laughs> you know what I mean? it because Space Jam 1 is, you know, all due respect to, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, is a, is a terrible movie. You know what I mean? Like as a film, you know, um, and it's an extremely, um, genius movie as a piece of, uh, lore and marketing, you know, for, you know, Michael Jordan and Lee Tunes. And I think that just that sort of juxtaposition of it being transcendently effective in one way and that transcendently a failure in another is kind of where you get this energy of cult classic. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think I was just, I was, you know, interested in that um, subversion because like, I know I'm here to freak people out. So I was interested in, the, I'm, I, I'm interested in somebody being like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Be like, but wait, you know what I mean? Like that's, <laughs> I'm interested in that, you know what I mean? As a dynamic. Um, and so, but just slowly as my, you know, name kind of came up, especially in different animation circles and like, how, you know, I'm an animator and like that kind of thing. I was just telling people about it. So and at that time I had this other animated film that was happening at Warner Brothers. And I was telling you like, yo, introduce, you know, so I'm talking it up as life is going on. And, you know, I see things, you know, they choose other directors. It, it comes together and falls apart a few times. And so when I got the call to do it, it was literally like, it was right after Random Max, you know, as it was coming out, you know, and it was like, oh, God, it's funny. Like, God works. Like, you know I mean? like my ancestors put this in it. Like, they are doing their thing. Like, it was not, it could only be understood as like, divine plan it was it is it, it has been the divine plan that i was put in that position by them to to learn what i learned in that process um but questions of like what people would think or not were not on my mind my only thing on my mind was making the thing that had come through to make you know and being in service to that 
And ultimately, you know, like I said, even though the story, you know, I, I changed the story and it, it evolved over time. It was still foundationally about, you know, my relationship to as a black boy who is an artist, but who is naturally gifted athlete, my relationship to um, concepts of being a black man, just generally in culture, what it, what it is to, you know, deviate in some way from that. Um, especially as a child and deviate towards things that could be understood to be more feminine, you know, art um, most principally. Um, and it, it was about that. And it was earnestly about me in that dynamic. And it was deeply felt for me. Um, so these are things that like I'm bringing to it and I'm saying, you know, this is going to repattern um, how black men parent their children when they deviate from, you know, the story and the mode of sustenance that helped them survive, you know what I mean? Because I know that the, the things my dad did in order to survive and the things he took up to protect himself against what he was facing to survive are 50% useful to me and 50% useless to me. And I want to tell a story about a man who is trying to project onto his child all the methods he used to survive and become a billionaire and they're 50% useful to him and 50% totally useless. And that's, you know, I would say that shit in the pitch meeting. <laughs> so that was, that, that's what was getting it going. You know what I mean? That, that energy, that earnestness, that emotion, that, that um, clarity of vision, you know, that's what pushed us through, you know, um, an industry that is disinterested in um, rendering black people with that level of clarity and ancestral mandate. That's what pushed us to, you know, to the, the, four weeks of production that we were able to do, you know, making it. And what I learned is the genocidal culture that exists in all of America and, you know, this place based on a genocide um, is everywhere. It's, it's most especially active and resistant when, you know, my ancestors and our ancestors are, in any way articulating themselves with a high level of power, clarity, organization, um, prayer. And that those, those energies of resistance organize themselves um, in, in such a way that like is ultimately suicidal for them. I didn't know that um, they would act in a masochistic way to protect a genocidal way of thinking, you know? And I think that that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, maybe the two other things, two big things. You know, I think of it like, you know, Tulsa 21 or Wilmington 1898, you know, kind of right after the Civil War, Reconstruction, before Jim Crow kind of comes into play. Black people out here getting elected to every office, you know, getting every job, getting every farm up and running, you know, getting every business popping, you know, going forth and multiplying post-slavery, you know, because in a lot of ways we had for 250 years at that point done all the work, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all the work, you know, and had a high level of skill and efficiency at doing the work and organizing the work. And obviously in its purest form, a kind of capitalist dynamic will just privilege the person going, they're going to do the best job for the longest, you know, and, um, story of reconstruction. And this is like, totally, I'm out of my lane. I'm not a historian. It's just, just like a theory. It feels like that a lot of the, the genocide, like the, the fly by night, like let's, let's, let's get a genocide popping it right quick overnight. That happened in those two cities. What happened in a lot of cities at that time is in reaction to, you know, white folks at that time in those cities seeing Black people succeed at that level economically, civically, and saying we can't compete. We're not going to beat them in capitalism. So, <laughs> in this moment, we we're not we can't compete. So we need to do what we can do to end the game. You know, we'll burn down the whole the whole thing. And that's what happened to us. You know what I mean? Um, it wasn't just me. You know, we we had some assembled a team that was highly effective at pushing through the prayer you know, to make an extremely entertaining movie that was extremely um, transcendent and, and 
you know, I think would have satisfied all the economic needs of a movie that, you know, cost that much. And I think we had done so because uh, we had sharp teeth. You know what I'm saying? Like we have been through a lot to that point, everybody involved. And um, we were skillful, you know, and not just skillful as technicians, but I think emotionally skillful. We were skillful at the, the job of negotiating with, with the beast at the end of the day. We were, we were skillful at, you know, keeping our, our head cool. You know what I mean? We were skillful at, you know, saying what we need to say when we need to say it and not saying what we didn't need to say when we didn't need to say it, you know? Um, this is not to say we were perfect, myself included. You know, I was not perfect. You know, I did, I, I, you know, did things one way. I would have done things another, certain situations. But um, the reason why I was fired was because we were succeeding. And there was no um, other solution than to end the game. And I learned that the game doesn't matter. You know, um, they would rather end it. Yeah. So just to pivot a little bit, I mean, I, everything you've been saying, it's been dropping all kinds of gems, and I really appreciate your uh, candor. And um, But I, I'd love to... Um, talk about season two of Random Acts of Flyness, which you just wrapped on HBO. And I wanted to ask you if you could talk about what was different doing this the second time around. Um, I would say, first of all, just like the just general energy of, you know, in season one, like literally every minute of every day, there was a general energy of like, this is never going to be on air. <laughs> <laughs> Bodies in the club, like, yeah, we were joking. What are y'all talking about? We're gonna put this on television. Are you crazy? You know what I mean? Like, I think that the energy, you know, when you watch it, it has that energy, you know? It's like, it's an urgency related to a lack of faith in the system to distribute um, random acts, which is designed to shift our own consciousnesses. You know, since it's come out, that's the biggest thing people ask or respond to is like, how did this get on TV? <laughs> and, but I think that, that that has meant that the mandate for season two is to like, all right, random act season one is possible. It happened. So now what's impossible? You know what I mean? And that has meant, you know, that the resist, you know, obviously because we're pushing it, <laughs> you know what I mean? The resistance is pushing back harder. You know, that's the that's the most important thing that's different is that um, you know, there's the sort of personal challenge to myself, like me challenging myself. Um, and that 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 grows more difficult, you know, like as things go on, you know, because because of everybody's out there pushing it, you know what I mean? Trying their best. Um you know, and then there's just the other reality of like, I, I think the show is definitely about going inside. You know, I think we, we watch season one, it is about that. It's like, oh, it's a bunch of writers and directors going inside, like looking at themselves and each other. And during the pandemic, when we started writing, you know, on Zoom, the whole writer's room was on Zoom. It was only 13 weeks, it was really short, relatively. Um, but, you know, like so much of the processing was about I mean, just uh, what was going on in the world was just so loud. You know, I think it was relatively more difficult to go inside in a way, even though that was like our mandate day one, you know. But, yeah, I think th those are the big differences. It's just like, yeah, those two things. Hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about Lala Bella, the... The space you and Maori and Elisa and some other incredible folks are finding in Baltimore. Um, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about Lalabella and why Baltimore? Baltimore, excuse me, Baltimore. Baltimore's native son. <laughs> <laughs> for y'all, for y'all that don't know, I'm I'm born and raised in Baltimore. That's why the second number uh, I pronounce it the way that I do. Um, yeah, why Baltimore? I think that um, no. Lisa really 
shepherded myself and a lot of us to Baltimore. Uh, I think in a, a a longer process, a generations long process of intentional community, you know. And I think um, being shepherded to Baltimore specifically is about, you know, just what's there, like you know, black life, you know, totally, um, just. In the in the in the expression that it's within, you know, is I think at a point when it, you know it's been in many major American cities like a pre resegregation gentrification dynamic. Not pre, but it's 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 not as far advanced in that process as some of the other places that we've all lived in, you know, in in America. And I think if we're gonna be in America, I think the intentional community aspect is to, you know, cultivate amongst ourselves, among black people, you know, um, attending practice, you know, to, to each other. So I, th I think it just sort of like expresses itself very, very, uh, transcendently along those lines of like just how black people move and interact and are in community is in a certain density, especially maybe typical of, um, of you know the east the large kind of cities in the east coast um and you know just that's the things you can say about it but it's really because the things you can't say you know what i mean you can't articulate it just feels right you know it feels it feels whole um and you know we're just in a in a ancestrally mandated process of of be conspiring together to to create conditions, you know, that will sustain us and, and the next generation and, and these, this practice of cinema, which is a healing practice, you know, all this stuff is a healing practice. And I think, it, you know, it's about, it's, it will come to be about supplying ourselves and our community with beauty, you know, um, and being um, strident in, understanding the conditions it takes to sustain that offering of beauty to, to ourselves, to each other, to, to obviously the, the, the other people in the world who are sustained by that vibration. You know, the, the, the way it's been phrased to me is to be like a bee, you know, because bees, they sustain, they sustain themselves off of their own food and their own food is extremely sweet. Mm -hmm. Maybe I guess to close it, I'm curious to what, what else is on the horizon. If there's anything you haven't experienced yet, spiritually, professionally, romantically, or intellectually or otherwise that you're, that you're looking to. I'm getting married in December. Mashallah. Congrats. You all are invited. Everybody listening is invited energetically. Just like, you know, pray for the kid. You know what I mean? Just like be in prayer in a very beautiful, transcendent prayer for, you know, the uniting of our lineages. Um, it's going to be beautiful and I'm excited for that, that, um, journey, you know, and, you know, I'm doing this, um, performance at the Whitney in September and, uh, it's called fourth dimension trigger, fifth dimension trauma. And it's a series of, it's a ritual. It's a series of invitations. Um, to trigger ourselves in the fourth dimension time, you know, backwards and forwards in time into traumas that may or may not have happened because they're in the fifth dimension, you know, there are many possibilities. And, you know, it's an it's a exploration of like the somatics of agency, you know, when you're triggered, you know, like sometimes it's like so other things take hold, <laughs> you know, other energies, other beings and, We're using puppetry, motion capture to explore that, what that feels like, what that seems like. So, you know, I'm really excited about that. That um, challenge, I'm really scared of it <laughs> in a good way. Uh, I'm excited about Lali Bella, like really deeply excited about it. Um, you know, just what it is to to think in, in more generational terms, in terms of what we're making, uh, maybe, maybe then 
we're used to even like, and you know, you're making a film, it takes a long time. So you have to kind of think longer term, but thinking more in the 25, 50 year term of like a site, a project, you know, in devotion to a city, a people, a capacity. So I think that that, that will always be a really beautiful, um, you know, exercise and practice, you know, to be in community with you all, you know, doing, doing that. Is there anything you want to say before we wrap? Just that I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. Glad, glad, you know, we've gotten to dance so too much, that we've gotten to dance so much together in this particular lifetime. Obviously, it's one of many. <laughs> so, in some ways, it's not that special, you know? <laughs> 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 um, all right. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm um, looking forward to seeing you at some point. Talk to you soon. Love y'all. All right. Love you too. Love you too, fam. Cheers, man. To keep up with everything Terrence does, you can follow him on Twitter at Terrence Nance, on Instagram at Terrence etc or in his website at terrencenance.com. This season of Mini Lumens is brought to you by Open Society Foundations. It is produced by Black Star Projects in partnership with Rohome Productions. The host and executive producer of Mini Lumens is me, Maori Carmel Holmes. Our guest co-host for this episode is Rashid Zakat. You can follow him at Rashid Zakat on all platforms. This episode was produced by Dallas Taylor. Associate producers are Irit Reinheimer and Farah Rahman. Managing producer is Alex Lewis. Executive editor is John Myers. Our music supervisor is David Little Dave Adams, Black Star's Music and Cinema Fellow, supported by the Pop Culture Collaborative. Our theme song was composed by Vijay Mohan and remixed by Little Dave. This episode features music by Helsinki Head Non Convention and Particle Ray. Sending you light and see you next time. <laughs>